Good morning. If you're in Washington, D.C. or the United States, good evening. If you're in China or Asia, uh, I'm Professor Michael Green, Director of Asian Studies at Georgetown University uh, and uh, Professor, and also some of you may know my work on policy issues at uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we're pleased you could join us uh, for the second uh, Zoom cast in the U.S.-China Dialogue Initiative series uh, on U.S.-China relations. Uh, the previous webcast was April uh, 16th, and you can see it on the Georgetown University Asian Studies or U.S.-China Dialogue Initiative uh, website. We had a fascinating discussion on U.S.-China relations in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, how much cooperation is possible, how bad will competition uh, and intensified rivalry become. Um, and now we're on our second uh, discussion. I'm delighted to have you join us, uh, where we'll focus on U.S.-China relations in the context of the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Um, you can already see that uh, the Trump campaign uh, is opening fire on uh, the presumptive Democratic nominee, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, uh, charging that he and Democrats are soft on China. Uh, Vice President Biden has fired back. You can see his first campaign ads on YouTube. Um, and uh, this is an early and intense um, volley uh, uh, before November is even here on uh, U.S.-China relations. Um, there are some big questions here. We have seen China feature prominently in presidential elections in the past. Uh, Ronald Reagan, for example, campaigned on a promise to renormalize relations with Taiwan and criticized Jimmy Carter for normalizing relations with uh, the People's Republic of China. Bill Clinton ran on a promise not to, as he put it, coddle the butchers of Beijing after Tiananmen. Um, I worked for President George W. Bush in the White House for five years running Asia policy. Uh, George Bush uh, said during the campaign, China's not a strategic partner, they're a strategic competitor. But in each of these previous examples, um, while U.S.-China relations um, were uncertain for a period of time, after about one or two years, each of those presidents, once they were elected and in office, uh, moved forward U.S.-China relations, achieving new uh, heights. Bill Clinton, for example, brought China into the WTO. Uh, George Bush and Hu Jintao had a close uh, dialogue on a range of complicated issues like North Korea. Um, and the Chinese side took the incoming political fire uh, and were patient and rebuilt the relationship. This time feels uh, different. The public opinion about China is much worse. Uh, the bipartisan consensus that we have a serious strategic problem with China is more uh, expansive. And, and Beijing's own stance is much more um, uh, assertive or, or less patient about um, American uh, criticism. Um, whether this is cyclical again, whether it reflects a deeper structural problem in U.S.-China relations, whether it will last beyond November, are hard questions. And we could not have assembled a better group of scholars, uh, journalists, uh, and analysts to help us um, try to answer those questions. We're joined by uh, E.J. Dion. Uh, E.J. is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution um, and a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post. I am an addicted reader. Um, and most important, he's a university professor at Georgetown University uh, in the Foundation of Democracy and Culture uh, program. Um, uh, E.J. has uh, received numerous awards, including the American Political Science Association's uh, Kerry McWilliams Award uh, to honor journalistic contributions to the understanding of politics. Um, his last book is um, germane. It's called One Nation After Trump, a guide for the perplexed, the disillusioned, the desperate, and the not yet deported, all of whom are represented in our audience uh, today, I'm sure. Um, he's a graduate from Harvard and was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. Um, Dr. Laura Silver uh, is a senior research uh, a researcher at the Pew Research Center, uh, where she's an expert in international survey techniques and methodologies, and she writes about international public opinion. She served in the State Department as a research analyst um, uh, in the Office of Opinion Research, um, where she designed and uh, implemented surveys in multiple countries in East Asia. She has a PhD from the Annenberg School for Communication and Political Science at University of Pennsylvania. And she did her doctoral work on U.S. public opinion of China. So she's been looking at this uh, as a scholar, as a government uh, analyst, and now at Pew. And uh, we'll hear from Laura shortly. She's going to present new findings from Pew's surveys of the American public about international affairs and particularly China. 
Uh, and then Zhao Jing Guo, Professor Zhao Jing Guo, um, a colleague and friend of many years, uh, Professor of Diplomacy and International Relations and former Dean uh, at the School of International Studies at Peking University. Professor Zhao received his PhD from Cornell in 1988. He's taught at University of Vermont, uh, Cornell, UCSD, uh, University of Sydney. He's a member of the Standing Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee of the National Committee of the Chinese People's Public uh, Pol Political Consultative Conference, and he's a member of the Standing Committee of the Central Committee of the China Democratic League. Um, he is a prolific writer um, and uh, much sought after um, panelist and speaker, not only in the US and China, but in Japan. I've been on panels with Jajiko all over the world, it seems, and we're delighted he could join us. Um, and we want you to join us as well um, in the audience. You can send us questions, um, which we can read to the panelists by emailing them to the following address, US China Dialogue at georgetown.edu. Um, that's uh, all one word, no punctuation. US China Dialogue at georgetown.edu. Uh, Tom Banchoff and Evan Medeiros, my colleagues, and Toya Wuhan from the US China Dialogue, thank you for helping pull us together and let's get started. Um, so we're gonna turn it over to Laura, who's gonna go through Pew's latest polling about China in the United States to give us some context. So over to you, Laura, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and pull up these slides so that everyone can hopefully see them. Okay. I'm delighted to be able to be here with you all to share our newest research, even under these kind of bizarre circumstances. Um, great to be able to virtually meet. Before I get started, let me give you a little bit of background about the Pew Research Center. We were established in 1996. We are primarily funded by the Pew Charitable Trust and we're nonprofit, nonpartisan, and non-advocacy. We call ourselves a fact tank rather than a think tank because we traffic in trying to make sure that the American public opinion and the publics from around the world are represented in policy discourse but we don't necessarily offer policy opinions ourselves. Since 2001, we've surveyed in 108 countries, though the research I'm gonna to present to you today is primarily drawn from the US context. And all of the results that I'm gonna show you today, as well as the underlying data, can be found online at our website. The survey I'm talking to you about today was conducted March 3rd to 29th of 2020 and was done with a thousand respondents via phone in the United States. And the margin of sampling error is plus or minus roughly 3.7 percentage points. The major thing I wanna start with is an overview of how Americans feel about China today. This is really the standout finding of our report, which is that unfavorable opinion of China is at its highest that it has been since we've been um, asking the question, which started in 2005. Today, two thirds of Americans have an unfavorable view of China. This is up um, not only at its highest level, but last year as well marked the highest level that we had seen in terms of unfavorable, unfavorable opinions and the highest year on year change that we had seen until that point. As you can see, unfavorable opinion of China has gone up nearly 20 percentage points since the beginning of the Trump administration. And while we've had ups and downs at other points in the history of our polling, as you can see, this really marks a stark up, um, uptick for two years in a row. In terms of how people feel looking at kind of the under the hood findings and the differences between groups, one thing you can see and that I'll show you in more detail on the next slide is that this is a somewhat partisan finding, even while majorities in both parties tend to have unfavorable views of China. Republicans, though, are more unfavorable than Democrats. 72% of Republicans or independents who lean towards the Republican Party have an unfavorable view of China, compared to 62% of Democrats and independents who lean towards the Democratic Party. There's no notable age difference between people who have a college degree and people who have less schooling. That's typical in our views of China. Um, in most years, we don't register a large uh, education difference. However, what we do see and what has consistently been true in much of our polling is that we have a very large age difference. Older people tend to be more unfavorable toward China than younger people. This is actually somewhat um, of an across the board trend globally where we tend to see younger people have more positive views of China, but younger people in most countries and in the United States actually tend to be more favorable towards most foreign countries and most foreign institutions or multilateral issues in general. This year also marks the first time that more than half of people under age 30 have an unfavorable, unfavorable view of China. You can see that 53% of people under 30 currently register an unfavorable view. But here's the partisan breakdown that I mentioned. So through most of our years of polling, you can see that Republicans have tended to be more unfavorable towards China than Democrats. 
But in 2019, we saw a very sharp uptick, particularly among Republicans compared to Democrats. And this year, again, we see that Republicans tend to be more unfavorable, again, 72% compared to 62% for Democrats. We also asked whether or not Americans see China as a threat. And I'm going to go through four different ways that we asked this question and our findings. The first is a question that we asked about whether or not China's power and influence is a major threat, a minor threat, or no threat at all to the United States. Here you can see that since we began asking this question in 2013, we've seen relatively consistent numbers of people who've said that China is some threat at all. But where we've seen most of the movement in recent years has been in whether or not China is perceived as a major threat or a minor threat. Just in the past year, the percentage of people naming China as a major threat has ticked up eight percentage points. But generally, since the beginning of the Trump administration, we've seen the percentage of people naming it as a major threat go up nearly 20 percentage points. And I'll show you the overtime graphic in a moment. With regard to how this rates compared to other threats that we asked about on this same survey, you can see that China's power and influence is seen as more of a threat to the United States than is Russia's power and influence as a comparison. But it definitely falls much lower in terms of the registered threat for most Americans than does the spread of infectious disease, terrorism, or the spread of nuclear weapons. Here you can see that over time change that I mentioned. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the percentage of people who name the spread of infectious disease as a major threat has gone up precipitously. And as we were fielding between March 3rd and March 29th, we actually saw the percentage of people naming that shoot up remarkably just over the course of the fielding period, because as you would note, that kind of encompasses the massive like, buildup that we saw in terms of um, policies domestically to respond to COVID. We also see that China's power and influence has risen substantially since, uh, especially the Trump administration began going up from around 41 percentage points in 2017. We did not see, however, a change in terms of the percentage of people who had an unfavorable view of China or who said China's power and influence was a major threat over the survey period. So between March 3rd and March 29th, there was no, um, no uptick in that in particular. But obviously, between our 2019 and our 2020 survey, we did see a major shift. We also asked Americans about particular problems and whether or not they're very serious, somewhat serious, not too serious, or not serious at all for the United States. These were a set list of problems that we asked respondents about. We, they weren't able to volunteer their own top problem. But you can see that among the problems that we asked about, China's impact on the global economy is seen as very serious by 61% of Americans. And then 57% say cyber attacks from China and China's policy on human rights are very serious problems. Slightly below that, though, we see some of the economic issues that have often factored into U.S.-China relations, including the U.S. trade deficit with China, which 49% say is very serious, and the loss of jobs to China, which 52% is, say is very serious. To give you a sense of how these have shifted over time as well, you can see each one of the, um, these five issues and note that China's impact on the global environment and China's policy on human rights are two issues where people have increased in terms of the percentage saying it's very serious. The same is true of cyber attacks. In contrast, the US trade deficit with China and the loss of US jobs to China have fallen somewhat as major issues since 2012, even while they've stayed relatively flat during the Trump administration. But as with many things in the United States, this is partisan. The percentage of people who say that the trade deficit and loss of US jobs to China um, are very serious problems tend to be higher among Republicans than among Democrats. In fact, Republicans tend to be more concerned about many of the problems that we asked about, with the sole exception of China's impact on the global environment, where we tend to see Democrats saying that it's much more of a very serious problem for the United States. One other way that we asked about Chinese threat was an open-ended question. And this one is drawn from the 2019 survey rather than the 2020 survey because it's the last time we asked this question. This open-ended question asked which group or country poses the greatest threat to the US in the future. And you can see that in 2019, the percentage of people naming China was tied with Russia as the country or group most named with 24% of Americans saying that China was the greatest threat to the US in the future doubled since we had asked the question in 2007. Again, major partisan differences existed here. Democrats were much more likely to name Russia, whereas Republicans were much more likely to name China. Finally, the last way that we've been asking over time about whether or not China represents a threat to the United States is a question that we've asked, which asks, 
whether China is more of an adversary, a serious problem, or not a problem. And you can see that the percentage of people who say China is an adversary in our 2019 survey were around a quarter of Americans, whereas 50% called China a serious problem and only 24% not a problem. This particular survey marked a massive uptick in the number of people who said China was a serious problem and a large decrease in the percentage who said it was not a problem at all. However, we haven't seen as much change in terms of the percentage of people naming it an adversary. Once again, though, as with many things in the US, we see partisan differences. So Republicans, again, are much more likely to call China an adversary with 30% calling it an adversary compared to 16% of Democrats. So I'll stop there, but really look forward to talking to you more about any of these findings or any of the other research that Pew has done on this topic. Uh, thank you, Laura. It's, it's, it's really um, interesting, and Pew's work is so authoritative. <clears throat> um, uh, and EJ will help put, put, us, put this in context for us, but if I could ask you, <clears throat> if you're allowed to um, be a little more think tank and a little less fact tank and, and give us a bit of a hypothesis, <clears throat> um, you know, compared to Pew's polling and polling I've done at CSS of elites, um, in some ways the U.S. is behind countries like Japan or Korea in these negative views of China. Japan and Korea have been there for a decade. <laughs> um, and I think we tend to track a little more uh, with Europe, although now I, I think comparatively probably American views are much, much harsher than views in Europe. But, but the question I have for you is why 2017 and 18? Um, the issues that would um, confound American views of China are complicated them are things like the South China Sea, uh, Xinjiang. A lot of these happened before 2017-18. Is your hypothesis uh, that it was new developments like Hong Kong, or was it the administration, um, which you know declared China a strategic competitor and so forth? What, what, what? Why 2017-18 uh, as the as the beginning of the real slide? Do you think? Well, so we saw a lot of the uptick actually between 2018 and 2019 in our polling. Uh -huh. And one of the things that we asked about on the 2019 poll was whether or not people thought that our economic relations with China were good. Um, obviously, we were kind of at the, the, our timing was actually in May, so we were not at the height of the trade war, but we were involved in the trade war. At that point, 53% of Americans said that current economic relations with China were poor, and people who thought economic relations were poor were more likely to have an unfavorable view of China. So we can't say anything causally with our data, which is cross-sectional, but there's relatively good suggestive evidence in our polling that people probably were thinking in terms of a strategic competition on economic lines and also had been hearing from the top for quite some time about how China was an economic threat to us, how we were engaged in this kind of tit for tat with them. Um, and since we see in our data that people who thought ec the economic relationship was poor tended to be more unfavorable, it's really suggestive of the fact that that was resonating with Americans. Interesting. Um, so EJ, can you give us your thoughts on what uh, the polls tell us and also you know, how it compares to previous presidential cycles, what we might expect, how bad it might get? Yeah, thank you very much. I want to thank Laura for a great presentation. Pew Data, uh, I've been involved with Pew for years, and I love Pew Data, and it's always helpful, and you did a great presentation. I'm actually going to take one of uh, the findings that Laura put out there and turn it on its head a bit, uh, because what I would emphasize most in all of her great, the findings she described so well, is how small the gap is between Republicans and Democrats on China. If you look at most polling in the United States right now, on issue after issue, the gap between Democrats and Republicans is a chasm, you know, 30, 40, 50 points. What I find significant about what Laura just showed us is that there's only a 10 point gap that 62% of Democrats have a negative view, 72% a percent of Republicans. And as the data she showed suggests, the increase in the negative views of China uh, go from 41 percent uh, negative up uh, to at a low point to 62 now. And I think that explains a lot about what we're going to see in the coming campaign and why I think this is going to be with us for quite some time. Um, the other thing I would underscore is uh, the issues that she noted uh, as important uh, particularly the environment and human rights, tend to be issues that Democrats uh, put at the center of their politics, at the center of their discussion of foreign policy. Uh, and I think this also suggests a hardening of views on China across the board. 
let me take a step back uh, and look at two things, the sort of historical way of presidential elections go and then what may be happening now. Um, it's an old cliche of political scientists and political consultants uh, that uh, elections involving an incumbent president uh, can be either referenda or choices. Um, they are usually uh, retrospective referenda uh, that Americans are broadly making a decision is the person in power good or bad? Or is the country better off or worse off? Um, when a president uh, senses that the country is supportive, and this is true in democracies across the world, um, when um, a, an incumbent perceives the country as reasonably satisfied, they might well run on their own record. Probably the most famous recent example of that was Ronald Reagan's 1984 campaign uh, with an ad uh, that he put up early on in the campaign. It's morning in America, and Reagan ran on how much better things were than they were four years uh, before. Um, my other favorite uh, slogan in that regard was Harold Macmillan in Britain in 1959, who famously said to voters, you've never had it so good. And they believed that, and they gave Macmillan uh, a landslide victory or a very solid victory in 1959. That's the unusual case because usually there's more dissatisfaction with an incumbent than was the case in those uh, two elections. Therefore, an incumbent will do all he or she can. In our case, we've yet to have a woman president. I hope we do someday. Maybe Laura will do the job uh, for us. Um, the, uh, the incumbent president doesn't want a referendum on himself. He rather wants to make it a choice with the opponent. And the idea is you may not like me, but that guy is way worse. Uh, in the early going of this campaign before the coronavirus and the economic collapse, uh, President Trump was hoping to have at least a little bit of the positive element there. He talks a lot about the economy, which was doing well um, in his typical fashion. He exaggerated his role in it. He obviously inherited a good economy from President Obama. Nonetheless, I think there was a subliminal message in his campaign uh, before the virus which is you may not like him very much, but you're not doing badly. The world's at peace, uh, job uh, unemployment's going down, wages are going up. Uh, don't take a chance on throwing Trump out. That whole strategy is now out the window uh, for Donald Trump. He can't run on the economy. He certainly can't run on his management of the crisis, although he's trying to defend um, his record. He's got to make it a negative referendum on Joe Biden. And it's very significant that the Trump campaign, there was a very good piece um, in a, a, an online journal, I think it's called Public Forum uh, by Robert Wright on Steve Bannon's view of what this campaign should be about. Steve Bannon um, is a well-known critic of China, but in fact, what uh, Wright uh, talks about, about Bannon really has become a centerpiece of the Trump uh, campaign, which is trying to tie uh, Joe Biden to China, hoping um, that the very the anti-China feeling in the country that Laura underscored from that survey could help Donald Trump. What is significant to me is that uh, Joe Biden's response to uh, Donald Trump was not um, in any way to say, well, Trump is wrong in his hostility to China. On the contrary, the Biden ad actually focused on all of the things President Trump said about President Xi that were positive at the beginning of the crisis, Biden attacked Trump for saying that President Xi has this all under control. Um, he attacked uh, Trump for saying they're going to get it under control and the virus won't be a problem here. I think that reflects a real shift over the last four or five years in the role of China in American um, politics that there has been a serious movement toward a view that the relationship with China is and will of its nature be far more negative going forward than it had been uh, in the previous period. Um, and I see nothing on the horizon that will suddenly lead to a snapback 
uh, to the old view. I, I am not doing this because I want to plug my new book, uh, Michael, uh, because I was going to do this anyway, but I actually had a book published in February called Code Red, How Progressives and Moderates Can Unite to Save Our Country. And I just wanted to explain that because I was going to look at the book. Um, to me, what really uh, we need to keep an eye on is the debate inside the Democratic Party uh, and among Democratic uh, foreign policy elites over China. Um, in the book, I single out two um, important uh, arguments, one by Michael Mandelbaum, who in an important article, um, I think in Foreign Affairs, talked about how we needed to move toward a containment policy uh, toward China. Um, which obviously has uh, uh, references back to the Cold War. Um, he also talked about Iran and Russia in the same uh, basket. Um, an alternative view came from uh, Jake Sullivan and Kurt Campbell, two uh, great foreign policy um, uh, thinkers in our country, and they were critical of neo-containment, and yet their view was quite hawkish too. When you uh, went below the surface, they said no neo-containment is not the right idea, but sustainable deterrence is the right idea. Obviously, you don't think of deterrence if you're talking about a would-be ally. Now, what they emphasized, and I think this gets to um, the nuance um, uh, uh, of the position, they say the Cold War analogy exaggerates the ex existential threat uh, posed uh, by China, um, but they argue that there are uh, there are nuances to be had. One other thinker I reference is Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, who says that uh, the U.S. and its allies will need to balance imperatives to confront, compete, and cooperate. Um, and I actually think that Martin Wolf trilogy is important. I think from Democrats, uh, to the extent that they're uh, that they avoid either containment language or sustainable deterrence. It will be to say, whether we like it or not, um, we need to cooperate with China on climate. We obviously, in some way, need to find a way to cooperate on pandemics and other international problems. And I think you'll hear some of that. But I think the stronger key will be on competition, containment, um, and a real worry about where China is going under President Xi. And that's the last point I will make. Um, uh, if you look at opinion in the United States, and again, I'm going to focus, um, uh, well, first on the Republicans, there's obviously a contradiction in the way in which President Trump approaches it. Um, on the one hand, given his propensity to say nice things about authoritarian leaders, he sometimes talks about President Xi in the same way that he speaks about President Putin uh, uh, and others. On the other hand, uh, opposition to China is obviously going to be key to his campaign. I think Joe Biden is uh, going to try to drive a wedge between those two Trumps and say the real Trump is the Trump who speaks positively about President Xi. Um, and I think that there are um, at least three issues that will harden opinion uh, in the United States toward China. One, and it received a lot more attention before the virus, is Hong Kong. Um, and every bit of news about uh, repression of democratic forces in Hong Kong um, is going to harden positions. I think, again, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm emphasizing the Democrats because they're the party out of power who might come into power. Um, that will really harden uh, democratic positions uh, against China. Second, the treatment of the Uyghurs. And third, the increasing centralization of power uh, in President Xi's hands. Um, the, those who were looking 20, 25 years ago to an improvement in relations argued that, well, with time, market changes, the, the fact that China is becoming more of a market economy will produce a more pluralistic political system. A lot of people who made those arguments have had to back away from those arguments or just say outright uh, that they were wrong. Um, so my view is that uh, not only in the short term, but in the medium term, and then the long term depends on events, and I don't pretend to be able to predict them. Um, I think that uh, relationships, uh, 
between our two countries will be pretty rocky. And in um, just in the interest of full disclosure, I'm, I myself am relatively hawkish on China. I share some of those concerns uh, that I outlined as someone on the more liberal or progressive side of our political spectrum. Um, and um, so that I think in closing um, that uh, in watching uh, this campaign, uh, we are far more likely to see its dynamic lead to a public hardening of positions on China uh, than any softening of American uh, positions uh, on China. And I think Laura's excellent data just underscored that for us. Thank you. Uh, EJ, that was uh, masterful. Thank you. I apologize for um, not plugging the new book. Now oh, I know why. It's uh, no. not a problem. I, all my... <laughs> My book promotion was interrupted by the coronavirus, so yes. it's not your, well, uh, your uh, fault. It's, but it's, thank you. But it's, I was going to quote it anyway, so I have my I have my free opening to plug the book. Thank it's it's going to be another great book, and now I know why the staff kept texting me with, you know, when I was interrupting you. Code red, code red. <laughs> oh, bless them! <laughs> I thought it was something Thanks. entirely different. Um, uh, so let me. I just want to before we turn to um, uh, Jia Jingguo, I want to ask you guys a couple quick follow up questions. Uh, and make an observation. Um, I also was struck by the narrow gap between Republicans and Democrats. And um, I, you know, as a as a part of the blob or the swamp at Georgetown and CSIS, I can tell you, and I think my colleagues uh, in in universities and think tanks would agree, about four or five years ago, the gap between conservative and progressive think tanks on China just suddenly closed. And the proximate cause in 2014-15 was the um, increasing uh, uh, Chinese military presence in the South and East China Seas, which experts would be watching maybe more than the general public. Um, and also around the same time, before the Trump administration, um, you saw a similar thing in Congress with, um, with more of a, of a bipartisan uh, uh, consolidation. So what I, I wanted to ask um, uh, Laura quickly, and then a question for EJ, is that typical in foreign policy polling of the American public? Does the elite tend to move first? Uh, or does the elite in an election year tend to react to the public? Or is, it, is there no common pattern? How, how do you uh, see that relationship between elite sort of expert opinion or political opinion and then the general public? Which, which tends to go first, yeah, especially in this case? You're asking a question that is probably the basis of an entire field of study in communications and political science. So it's a little bit difficult to say anything with certainty. Um, one of the theories of public opinion, though, is that um, it's from John Zoller, is basically that people receive a stimulus from elites or from trusted people, and then they kind of accept it. And then when you ask them their opinion, that's what they draw upon. And so the idea would be that um, when people hear people that they trust in power say that they don't like China or that we're competitors or that we're in a trade war, um, or that China's an irresponsible um, stakeholder in the international community, you would then expect people who supported those elites to echo back that opinion. One of the interesting things about this theory, though, is that typically, and particularly as EJ mentioned, we have such a partisan system that you have cross pressures of different attitudes. So Republicans listening to Republicans hear one thing, Democrats listening to Democrats hear another thing, and so it kind of balances out in terms of what people have in the ecosystem. China's relatively unique because there isn't anyone running on the let's be best friends with China platform, right? In fact, we have elites more often doubling down on who should be tougher on China. It comes out in campaign ads already this year. It came out in campaign ads in 2012. When people on both sides of the aisle tend to be echoing the same thing, which is that China is the threat to the United States or that we need to be tougher on China, you would expect then that people on both sides of the aisle as well would follow the elites. We can't say that causally with our data. The other way to flip the same data is that because people have these latent, um, they, they have this latent dislike of China, we then see elites kind of seizing on that as an issue and running on it because it's popular. That also has some credibility. But typically, since Americans can only form p opinions on foreign countries in a number of ways from the media, from the elite, or from personal experience, which is really not something that the vast majority of Americans have when it comes to China. It's really suggestive of the fact that when elites kind of take this strong line and they're taking it in a united front across Republicans and Democrats, that we should be tough on China and China's an enemy, you would then see public opinion move in that direction. 
That's that's uh, helpful, and that's uh, a very nice, concise uh, uh, version of what is probably several PhDs. So thank you. Um, so EJ, I um, I'm I'm I am most definitely not a political expert. My only uh, insights are from four failed Republican presidential campaigns, beginning with uh, John McCain and then ending with uh, Jeb Bush. But I, I two two experiences that I wanted to uh, test on you in the current context. I remember in the Romney campaign, and you probably remember this, Governor Romney took some shots at China saying he would call them a currency manipulator. And in the early fall in 2012, he suddenly stopped. And the reason was that the pollsters and focus group experts were saying that in Ohio and some key swing states, farmers didn't like it. Um, and so he just stopped. So, you know, the first question is, is it possible this is still a fishing expedition um, as uh, the Trump campaign looks for a theme or you think it's going to be with us? And the second question is, what about the donor class? Um, you know, as, as, as you both pointed out, there's nobody running on Be Nice to China, but the traditional Republicans, the Wall Street uh, Republicans, but also the donor class for the Democrats, I, I think, have a much more benign view of China because they're generally making money. Um, you think that might temper this at all, or are they um, are they going to join the join the, the herd in criticizing China? So, uh, is it a fishing expedition, and and what about the the, the donor class? Well, I want to answer that by underscoring uh, something Laura said in her excellent presentation of elites and their influence. Um, I think that um, the shift in elites in the foreign policy elites in the same direction. I think she's broadly right about that. I think that on the Republican side, um, Trump Trump's views are so important to those who now think of themselves as Republican, which is to say, if you call yourself Republican in a poll, it means in some way that you're identifying with Trump, which is why there has been a slow trickle of Republic, former Republicans away from uh, the Republican Party. So Trump's own views on China, I think, have a very substantial effect on uh, Republican opinion. On the Democratic side, the China as currency manipulator argument was actually an argument made by a lot of prominent Democrats before Trump. Chuck Schumer, uh, the Democratic leader, uh, was uh, very prominent in making that argument. Obviously, the labor movement, uh, which is an important, important ally of the Democratic Party, was making arguments along those lines. So that provided some sort of a basis for opposition before. I think the gap between elites and the public may be that I'm not sure the maneuvers on the South China Sea moved it, but very particular public events like the ones I listed, Hong Kong Uyghurs um, and um, uh, increasing centralization of power um, were part of it. But I also think that it is now becoming, because of Trump, in reaction to Trump, opposition to American foreign policy rooted in coddling authoritarians, I'll just put it that way in campaign terms, uh, I think is very central to the democratic person on the street worldview, and that there is more and more of a tendency to conflate President Xi and President Putin into a category of authoritarian of the sort that Democrats um, are opposed to. Um, I think the intriguing thing that, the, about the um, donor class is I think Democratic politicians are going to be very wary of um, seeming to take positions on issues and including Joe Biden because of the Democratic donor class. Democratic donor class um, is maybe popular for their money, but they're not popular uh, in the uh, necessarily among rank and file uh, Democrats. And I do think that you will hear, I think farmers is an, I think you're raising farmers is very interesting because uh, President Trump had to come up with this massive subsidy for farmers um, uh, after the trade war started because he knew how important farmers were uh, to the Republican Party. And so he thought he really literally had to buy them off uh, in order not to create a backlash uh, against his policies. So I think farmers um, will be interesting to watch because um, they can, you know, they're, they're, um, they have some importance in parts 
of those swing states that we tend to see as industrial but have large uh, farming uh, pieces. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there will be those arguments. But again, and you would actually be better placed to answer this question than I would. What strikes me is the donor class also um, are the kinds of people who consume the work of China experts. And the China experts, those donor class folks are consuming, are far more hawkish than they were. Um, if you will, it's an elite to elite transmission. Um, and so while, yes, there will be businesses that make money in China that are going to talk from their money, um, I think that um, there is going, there's probably even a shift in that group. But again, uh, you may be more familiar with that class than I am. So I'll leave it. I, I'm not implicating you. I'm just saying uh, by in the nature of things, you might be able to uh, help us on that. Because I'm very curious what you think on your own question. <laughs> if you I can share one more thing. You can tell from the modest library behind me that I am not part of the donor class. Oh, I uh, understand that, but I understand I know. you know what I mean. I know. Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, I think the, the clearly the Chamber of Commerce, Wall Street is is divided on China in a way they weren't when I was in the White House. When I yes, was in the White House with President Bush, you could count on a ninety percent consensus in the Chamber of Commerce or Wall Street on China policy, and now it's much more. Uh, there's some companies making money. There's some companies that are furious at China because of intellectual property rights. So it's it's so in a way, in that sense, they are no longer bulwark. And I'll briefly advertise a project I have. Um, uh, I, I I I'm not Pew, but I do have a a, a poll a project underway of a business uh, elites at farmers labor uh, on China, uh, sort of digging deeper to get a sense of their tolerance for decoupling and confrontation. Um, we're collecting questions. Thank you. That's excellent. That's, yeah. that's exactly. Laura, I'm sorry. I wanted to hear. Oh, Laura, did you have something? There? Oh, yeah. Can I show one more? I'll share my screen one more time and show one more slide. Um, this was also from 2019. But I think it's worth noting that if you decouple what we're talking about when we talk about China from potentially particular trade policies, you'll wow. see that when we ask about whether or not tariffs between the U.S. and trading partners are good or bad for the U.S., we see massive partisan differences of the type that EJ was mentioning earlier. This is more along the lines of the 50 percentage point or 60 percentage point gap. So when we talk about China and whether or not people want us to be tough on China, it's important to think that that can still be partisan depending on what the policy itself is and that tariffs themselves were very, very unpopular among Democrats. And then when we've asked over time on our economic and trade policy in particular, if it's more important to build a stronger relationship with China or to get tougher on China, many people, at least through 2019, said to build a stronger relationship with China. But this one, as well, was partisan. So this is the percent who say it's important to get tougher with China on economic issues. Republicans have held relatively steady, whereas Democrats, as the kind of tariffs became increasingly the, the tool with which we did it, became less likely to say we should get tough on China. Uh, Laura, would you agree that one of the reasons for that tariff position is because it was associated as a policy of Donald Trump. And so the polarization on Trump himself helps explain some of this difference. It's vast, so there are a lot of things going on, but I think that the attitudes toward Trump himself are very influential in attitudes on tariffs. Uh, I can't say that causally with our data, but our, it's incredibly suggestive of that, especially because the slide that you're looking at currently Within Republicans, we see a huge difference between conservative Republicans and less conservative Republicans. And it's conservative Republicans who typically want to get tougher, um, kind of the Trump policy, whereas we see maybe among the more traditional Republicans that we would have thought of, the less Trumpian ones um, historically, then we see less of a, a strong stance here. Thank you. Interesting. Um, so uh, let me remind the audience, we're collecting questions. I have some good ones. And, and you can send your questions by email to US China Dialogue, all one word, US China Dialogue at georgetown.edu. So, Professor Zhang Jingguo, I apologize for keeping you waiting. Uh, you're, you're a distinguished uh, scholar. And uh, the only reason I did was I wanted you to be able to hear the polling data in the US and some of these discussions about why um, US views of China have deteriorated and why this is such a huge issue in our election. Um, and now uh, the floor is yours, Jingguo. We'd really appreciate your view as a scholar of U.S.-China relations, but also um, as a, an influential thinker in Beijing. Um, uh, where did this come from? Where is this heading? 
uh, how do you think it plays in China? So Jingguo, thanks for your patience. Very keen to hear your views. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's great to uh, hear the two uh, speakers' uh, comments. Um, uh, actually, I found the statistics uh, more or, or less disencouraging. <laughs> Uh, I expected something worse, <laughs> given, <laughs> given the, the, the unity uh, and consensus on the part of Washington uh, uh, on the question of getting tough with China. Uh, American uh, people are not following that, uh, 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 you know, clearing call uh, that closely, uh, but it's moving in the wrong direction. Uh, when you talk about the uh, current uh, presidential election uh, campaign, uh, one irony is um, that, you know, normally uh, the opposition party candidate would uh, condemn the ruling part, the incumbent party uh, uh, government uh, for being too soft on China. In this case, it's quite interesting that the, the, the incumbent party, the Trump administration, tried to uh, attack uh, the, the opposition party candidate for being too soft on China, right? And, 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 the, uh, and the, the Biden campaign uh, ad basically is saying that, uh, you know, uh, you, 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 are, you, you are no better. Uh, you say something very nice things about China too. Uh, of course, if you know what's going on, uh, you know that uh, what Trump said, uh, he did not mean it. Uh, basically, uh, he has no good feeling for China. Uh, he say those things rhetorically uh, to achieve his, uh, uh, his goals. Uh, so uh, I think uh, over time, uh, Chinese have learned that, you know, despite all the nice rhetoric, uh, you know, this administration probably is the worst uh, in terms of uh, approach on China. But this is, uh, 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 this uh, uh, presidential campaign happens against a, a background uh, of a very bad political uh, atmosphere uh, on China. Okay? There is a high degree of consensus uh, in, in Washington that uh, the U.S. has to adopt a tough approach on China. Uh, the difference is about, uh, you know, the tactics, okay? how to do it, uh, rather than whether we should be tough with, with China. Why hasn't happened? Uh, why has it happened this way? I think uh, there are many reasons. Uh, one is. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this uh, South China Sea and East China Sea issue, uh, which hardened uh, the, the, the view of those people who want to contain China anyway. Uh, basically, they are saying, look, China is an expansionist. Uh, you know, we should, we have to be tough on China, otherwise uh, we'll be uh, the next Hitler or, or, uh, or, or, or Japan. And then uh, the political de uh, development in China uh, disappointed uh, the Democrat, uh, the, the liberals uh, who used to support engagement, uh, not just liberals, but also the, the, some uh, realists, uh, moderate realists. Uh, they had hoped that uh, as China uh, e e grows economically and and engages with the rest of the world. China will become more liberal, uh, if not democratic. Uh, but then uh, they're disappointed uh, with China's development, especially the direction of development. So they uh, began to draw, uh, draw the conclusion that maybe our previous policy of engagement is wrong. Okay? So it's very interesting, with, within a very short period of time, okay, a few years time, uh, before, you know, at the beginning, you know, a lot of people were supportive of engagement uh, during the Obama administration. And in a few years time, 
nobody is supporting the engagement, or very few people are supporting engagement, at least in public. Uh, so it's a very short, a very quick shift. Uh, that has a lot to do with this kind of a, a, a you know, a develop, you know, this change of mind, this this conclusion that previous approach was wrong. Uh, so let's give it, give the hardline approach a try. And also, when Trump when when Trump tried to push for his uh, uh, his uh, uh, deals, uh, you know, he he tried to push other countries to make deals with him. Uh, you know, China saw uh, other countries try to curry favor with Trump, so China thought you know they could also uh, try to satisfy some of Trump's demands. So despite Trump's uh, very unreasonable uh, demands, China tried to be friendly. Uh, uh, and this sort of uh, made the, the previous engagement people very upset because they say that we were trying to be nice to you and you were, you were not cooperative, uh, cooperative. And Trump is very tough on you and you are very cooperative. Uh, so they drew a conclusion that toughness pays. Okay. So, uh, but but so all these things uh, matter. Uh, um, ultimately, I think the future development of the relationship depends on, uh, I think, gradual realization on the part of people in Washington that, you know, they have to face the reality. Uh, they are now in a sort of emotional mode, uh, uh, emotional mood. Um, uh, the, 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 the reality is China is a large country, is a stakeholder, has vested interests in the existing international order. Okay? It's not a revolutionary power okay? uh, Try to overthrow this order. As stakeholder, China and the U.S. have a lot of uh, shared interests and stakes in working together. Uh, to be tough on China, you know, on given on specific issues, that's fine. But to take a confrontational approach, this is not in the U.S. interest. Of course, it's not in China's interest either. Okay. So ultimately, I think this kind of realization will happen. Uh, I hope it will, <laughs> it will happen sooner than than later. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Jinguo. Um, your observation that there's a consensus in Washington, uh, which you know well, I didn't mention in your bio that you also were a, a fellow at Brookings Institution and know the Washington debate well, but your observation that there's now a consensus on tactics, it's time to push back, but uh, not necessarily on objectives. I think that's right. And when EJ and uh, Laura uh, earlier pointed out that there's a difference between conservative Republicans and moderate Republicans on this question of how hard to push back China. I, I consider myself a moderate, uh, Let independent. Let me put it this way: there, there is a consensus on on being tough on China. Exactly, which is but a. But then uh, they are different in terms of objectives and also exactly uh, tactics. <laughs> exactly, and there are some differences in tactics, but but the what the polling doesn't, maybe it does, but what the polling doesn't tell you yet is. Uh, what ultimately people expect of China. And I think the differences between moderate uh, conservatives and conservative Democrats on the one hand and um, more hawkish conservatives on the other is the hawkish conservatives, the most maybe extreme example being Steve Bannon, do not think there's any hope for U.S.-China relations um, and view it, as you said, sort of like um, Japan or Germany in the 1930s. Whereas the moderate conservatives and I think conservative Democrats think, yes, we have to be tough, but that's to get us back to a better equilibrium, a place where we can have a more constructive relationship. And that dynamic, you know, what is this all for, I think is still uh, in play, even while there's a consensus on tactics. Can I ask you, Jingbo, quickly before turning to EJ and Laura to see if they have questions or comments for you? Um, can you can you give us a flavor in China? Uh, the, there's not polling like Pew, uh, there's some, but not as much. Um, how would you characterize the public view in China of this debate in the US, if there is one? And how are the elites and foreign policy experts debating it? 
Well, I think um, uh, the the views of uh, the public on the U.S. has also been deteriorating, uh, uh, probably uh, equally, if not more. Uh, uh, you know, on the on the downside, uh, uh, basically, people are, are thinking that uh, it's not about pushing China to do reforms. I mean, U.S. approach. It's to it's about undermining China, containing China, destroying China's prospect of development. Uh, so increasingly, people are uh, frustrated and angry. Uh, uh, even among the the so experts uh, or, or or elite, uh, I think this view is growing. Uh, so basically, uh, the the hardline people uh, in create this dynamic uh, of uh, uh, getting tough on each other uh, and uh, forcing the, the making the relationship uh, forcing the relationship into a downward spiral at the moment. Um, EJ or Laura, do either of you have a a, a response or a question for uh, Professor Judging? Yeah, could I come in or Laura? Could you Please. come in first if you'd like? No, you are, um, Go ahead, EJ, yeah. and then we'll hear from uh, Laura. The, um, first of all, when uh, the, uh, thank you for that presentation. Thanks very much. I, when the professor said he thought those were good numbers, and I don't know if this will translate well into Chinese for those who may be looking at captions, uh, but there was an American socialist, Eugene Debs, who said there should be another beatitude, which is blessed are they who expect nothing for they shall not be disappointed. Uh, if those numbers are good, are better than he expected, he expected something uh, pretty awful. Um, I'll tell you what I appreciate about what the professor said, and I'd like him to talk about the implications of that. And then one word he used that I found disturbing. Um, it seems to me that he was acknowledging that um, these views didn't change because there was something vague in the air. These views changed because of very concrete events on the ground in China and around the world. We've already mentioned the military maneuvers, Hong Kong, Uyghurs, the centralization of power. I would mention two others. Uh, one is the perception of the Belt and Road Initiative and a question of what is China trying to do? Is China trying to push out American influence uh, in other places? But perhaps the most important thing in terms of mass opinion was um, uh, a change in the attitude toward um, what an economic opening to China meant. Because as he suggested, the liberals were disappointed because rather than leading to a broad liberalization of China, what seems to have happened instead is a hardening of the authoritarian regime. So they are disappointed. And then in terms of the economic benefit, I think from the moment that uh, WTO opened to China, people started looking at, and the Trump election really underscored this, given where he picked up votes in the industrial Midwest, um, there was a huge flight quickly of uh, industrial jobs uh, to China uh, that hurt particular parts of our country that Trump uh, spoke for uh, in that campaign. But it wasn't just Trump doing that. There were a lot of Democrats, Sherrod Brown is one who might come to mind, who were saying, wait a minute, this economic deal isn't working for us, and it is not even... Um, uh, doing the things in China that we hoped it would do. Because from the point of view of the old policy, a more liberalized China might represent less of a threat to American values and American interests. A more authoritarian China is seen as representing much more of a threat uh, to American values and American interests. So I'd like him uh, to respond to that. The, the one phrase he used, which I found disturbing, was destroying China. Um, and I don't think that even the most hawkish people in the United States are trying to destroy China, uh, but they are very worried about the fruits of the policy that we have pursued up to now because they were looking forward to a somewhat different kind of China that might actually be 
um, uh, more cooperative with the United States in the future. So just reflecting all that back to him, I would love, because I'm trying myself as an American to understand the hardening on the Chinese side way better than I do. Um, I obviously understand why we are hardening because I'm really part of that. I would put myself uh, in that camp. I was always somewhat more skeptical of the economic opening leading to liberalization than others, but I really want to understand what's happening in China in response to all this and why he particularly used the word destroying. Um, that's, that's great. Laura, uh, uh, Jingguo, let me hear from Laura, then you can uh, answer both. If you have a question or response. No, good. Okay, uh, over to you, Jingguo. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, uh, a word on clarification. I said destroying the, the, the prospect of China's growth, uh, economic development. Uh, actually, they are both want to destroy China. People like Peter Navarro, he has no, no sympathy for China. Uh, no good feeling for China. Uh, um, but these are very few, uh, you know, extreme people. Uh, most people, of course, uh, you know, they want, they, they, most Americans, uh, I, I've lived there for more than 10 years. Uh, I know that they, 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 they have, uh, they have good feelings. Uh, uh, they, I know what they want. Uh, what I'm saying is that in China, why people are becoming more and more frustrated? Um, I think it has a lot to do with the with the uh, Trump administration's approach, and also now the this uh, elite Washington people's approach to China. Basically. Um, you know, they when you push for reforms, uh, push for changes in China, uh, at the beginning when Trump was trying to get a deal with China, you know, many people in China thought, well, this is good, right? Because uh, we need uh, some external pressure for launching domestic political reforms to to move move the uh, economic reforms. Okay, um, but uh, then we realize it's not just about pushing China to, to change uh, economic, uh, to, to make economic reforms. It's about um, many other things, okay? Uh, basically, the, the Trump administration, at least some people in the Trump administration are, make, are demonizing China. You know, the Belt and Road Initiative is not an attempt to, to get rid of the American influence. It's an attempt to, you know, um, for China to launch another uh, stage of China's economic development. Uh, China's eastern part of China has grown to the extent that it has excessive capital, technology, and managerial skills. Okay. And, uh, how to grow in the next stage. Okay. One way to do it is to, uh, to go out, to go to uh, outside the world. You know, they find this opportunity to, to build infrastructure. Then they started this uh, 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 AIIB, uh, uh, Asia Investment Development uh, uh, Bank, okay, investment bank. And then they they have this Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, create uh, try to create a market for China's excessive uh, capital, technology, and and managerial skills. Okay, and of course, uh, at the same time, it also wants to secure raw materials and, and also uh, other kinds of uh, uh, you know economic uh, benefits from this process. But viewed from the U.S. Uh, administration, it, it's a sort of a, a Chinese attempt uh, uh, on the basis of a grand strategy to dominate the world, to, to get rid of the U.S. leadership. That's not true. China tried to solicit the U.S. to join this, uh, to work together. Uh, actually, we are working together with Japan. Uh, uh, Japan is saying that I'm not joining the... the uh, Belt and Road Initiative because uh, of the U.S. Pre uh, concern, but they say that you know we have our own 
uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, and uh, we can do things uh, in, in the overlapping area. Okay, we can work together in the overlapping area. That's cooperation on on, on infrastructure projects. We welcome American companies to join, but but then the in the administration's uh, rhetoric, it's a death trap. Uh, it's a way to get rid of the American influence. Okay. Uh, uh, it's a way to, uh, to, for China to engage in, uh, in international expansion. You know, this, so everything China does is now viewed from a negative perspective. Even people to people exchange is viewed from a negative uh, uh, lens, saying that Chinese scholars and Students are suspects of spies, uh, espionage, you know, uh, and uh, so it's necessary to control the visas and that sort of thing, and, and making a lot of universities very upset. Uh, and of course, a lot of Chinese students, scholars are very upset. Uh, so the, the, the atmosphere is poisoned. Uh, uh, and even, uh, you know, when we talk about technologies, uh, Huawei, the U.S. Uh, uh, try to block Huawei, uh, not only in the U.S., but also in, uh, in other uh, markets uh, all over the world, saying that Huawei is a security risk. Okay. Um, but the problem is, you know, those countries, they studied on Huawei's uh, technologies, and they decided that they would use select part of Huawei's technologies, which are not security uh, uh, security problem. But then the U.S. is saying that you are not supposed to do business with Huawei, with, with Chinese tech, high-tech companies, because you are helping the Communist Party. Okay? So this is, uh, this is what I mean, that it's, you know, it's, it's not just uh, about, uh, it, uh, about management of the relationship, it's about containment. Uh, and chi some Chinese are, are saying that it's not about money anymore. It's about life. Okay. So we are, the relationship is moving toward confrontation, all out confrontation. I'm not exaggerating it. Uh, I'm no. worried about it. No, this is, um, this is uh, precisely why we were um, delighted to have you join us to convey um, in, a, in real time how this is being debated and seen in Beijing. And um, I have to agree that in some areas, the rhetoric of the U.S. has become overheated. Um, one thing I would just flag uh, for um, uh, listeners uh, on our uh, uh, Zoomcast uh, from China, we have a number of journalists, scholars, and students from China. Often the dynamics in U.S.-China relations are seen as um, purely bilateral. And things like the Obama administration's pivot to Asia, which were criticized in China, or the U.S. position on 5G, um, in ways that are not always seen in China, these are not, uh, these are responses that the U.S. government or think tanks or elites make to warnings they hear from neighboring countries in Asia, uh, from Japan or Singapore. Um, uh, and that is part of the reason this is structural, because the U.S. is a, is, is, is a, is a resident power in the Indo-Pacific and is very responsive to allies and partners who raise alarm bells about China. And I think personally that explains part of the structural shift, certainly among elites over the last five years. But interestingly, and then I'll turn to the questions, you know, Japan-China relations were horrible, horrible um, uh, until recent years. They're still pretty bad, but, and you know China, Japan well, um, but in public opinion polls, the Chinese view of, of Japan has suddenly improved 30 or 40 points. Um, which, which goes to show that um, when uh, Zheng Donghai, when the leadership wants to send a positive signal about a relationship, it might be possible. Um, let me get back to that. Can I just say one quick thing? Yeah, real quick, then I want to get the questions in. Yeah, just, thanks. Um, I, find it, I, I guess I find it worrying that uh, I think it would be a big mistake for China to take um, a few of the most extreme statements by the Trump administration and say that, well, therefore, we can rally Americans against that kind of language. The Trump administration, uh, for, and I am no fan, as anybody out there knows from what I write day to day, I am no fan of the Trump administrations. But 
the reflection of a real change in opinion in America on China is real. It goes way deeper than the Trump administration. It is shared by critics of the Trump administration. It is not about destroying China's economic prospects. It is a reaction to a series of developments that we see happening in China, uh, both in terms for some it's disappointment, for others it causes alarm or both. A reaction also to the nature of the economic relationship, which as Michael, as you pointed out, some business people felt had become, even business people who are friends of this relationship had decided was exploitative. So I think it's a grave mistake for China ever to think this is simply a Trump thing. This is something that runs rather deep right now um, in American politics, and that if China escalates in places like Hong Kong uh, against the democratic forces, uh, it's only going to make this uh, even worse, uh, because I think most Americans would love to see China evolve as a system and become more democratic, and a more democratic China would be a China that the U.S. would be happy to work with. What we see is the evolution going the other way, and that's very alarming. So let me get to the questions, um, and uh, we'll, we'll, if I could ask everyone to be a little brief, the discussion's been excellent, but we want to try to fit in uh, as many of the questions as we can. Um, actually, um, apropos EJ's point just now, um, uh, one um, uh, Chamber of Commerce um, uh, representative asked a question online uh, about um, how whether whether Beijing or or um, uh, scholars or officials in Beijing are considering steps China might take between now and November to reduce the criticism, uh, different approaches to the East China Sea, to Hong Kong, to trade. Is there any debate in Beijing uh, about what steps China might take to, to tone things down? Or, um, as my colleague Evan Medeiros asked in his question, uh, is there any um, floor under the Chinese response? Will, 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 um, will Xi Jinping and the leadership feel obliged to swing and hit back every time there's a negative comment? So that's back to you, uh, Jingguo, if you could help us understand the debate in China about this right now, a little a little more than you just did, which was good. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I think um, uh, it's not just about uh, the Trump administration. Uh, I agree. Uh, uh, you know, when the Congress passed uh, uh, Taiwan Travel Act, and also a few pieces of uh, Chinese belief, uh, anti-China legislations. They are either unanimously or uh, with a you know, big majority. Uh, uh, this shows you know, how uh, you know, negative the views of the part of the uh, people in Washington on China. Uh, that's making Chinese more frustrating. Uh, because it's not just the U.S. administration's policy; it's about Washington. Okay. So you know it's more frustrating because uh, you don't see any hope <laughs> to melt to a lot of people <laughs> for for uh, uh, you know the more pragmatic policies <laughs> or, or behavior on the part of Washington. Um, what should you know? Uh, also on the question of Hong Kong, you know, I think this is a, a sad story because uh, uh, the demonstrators, uh, when they demonstrate, uh, that's fine. Uh, but then when they demonstrated violently for a long period of time uh, and the US still endorsed it, uh, that's not fine for China. Uh, because uh, if you, if, you know, basically, you know, you have a legislation saying that to condemn Hong Kong uh, administration's handling of the demonstrations. But if you look at the uh, the real uh, situation, I, I I was watching the the, the development uh, coverage uh, every day uh, during those uh, year, days of demonstrations. The Hong Kong police was acting extremely pro professionally. Actually, uh. No police in the world would have you uh, would behave like that, you know, uh, in such a strange, restrained way. They didn't 
despite all these violent provocations, they didn't fire, they, they didn't kill anyone. Uh, you know, everybody was expecting some bloodshed. Uh, but a lot of people uh, on, the, on, the, on the more extreme side, uh, there but nothing like that happened. Uh, I mean, the Hong Kong police should be commended. Uh, but it's unfortunate that because of this uh, international support of uh, the demonstrations, despite it's, it became violent, uh, the Chinese government felt that this is a sort of international conspiracy, or at least a US a Western conspiracy uh, to, to plot Hong Kong against China. That, in a way, added to the incentive on the part of the central government to do more to control uh, Hong Kong. So it's unfortunate, uh, this uh, negative set of interactions uh, that was unleashed. Um, you know, what would China do in, in the next few months uh, uh, with regard to the election? It's hard to say. Uh, if I were uh, asked to advise the Chinese government, I would ask the Chinese government not to do anything. Let the Americans uh, settle their own business. Okay. Uh, uh, I think uh, Biden is more likely to win because uh, not because uh, he uh, uh, he is uh, uh, you know extremely uh, 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 you know, he has demonstrated a great feat, but because Trump's behavior. It's terrible. Okay. You know, a lot of blames on China saying that China did not uh, handle the uh, COVID-19 crisis well. And then, uh, uh, you know, even some people in Congress were trying to, to, to pass a resolution to condemn China and demand China compensation. But it's the U.S. government that failed the American people. China had uh, this crisis in Wuhan, like two months before it hit, I mean, it became a big problem in, 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 in Washington, uh, in, in, in the US. But then the US came, you know, like, like had a surprise. And then we had so much damage. So many people died. It's incredible. Okay. And then they are still saying that the Chinese numbers are wrong. Chinese hide the facts, but the reality is people here, the life here is returning normal. But ideology, ideology, bias have, you know, blinded us from the realities in Hong Kong, in, in the main, in China on the COVID-19 uh, issues. Uh, we had a problems, we have a lot of problems. Especially, uh, you know, when we talk about the handling of the COVID-19 crisis, at the beginning, we had a lot of problems. Okay. But eventually, when we realize it's a serious pandemic, we try to stop it. Okay. And the government was very effective. Okay. Uh, but of course, ultimately, uh, whether, you know, we will be able to, uh, to wade through the next, uh, the, the future, I don't know. But so far, uh, you know, I, I think the government did a good job uh, after the initial problems. Okay. So, Jingguo, this, um, uh, this is the challenge of this topic because the debate, as you've heard uh, from EJ and from Laura, the debate is being driven by American politics, no doubt about it. That's fuel in the fire. But, um, but there are, as you've heard from uh, the American panelists, there are underlying um, facts and uh, developments in Hong Kong and elsewhere that predate COVID-19, um, and, uh, you know, it is entirely possible that the American public could blame Donald Trump for what's uh, happening and put him out of office, and at the same time blame China even more than they are today, because the facts continue to come out about uh, what happened. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than just ideology, although that complicates it. Let me try to slip in, if I could, um, a couple quick questions. Um, a, a number of people, actually, Laura, had questions for you about the poll um, it was interesting, and a number of people, students and uh, professionals, asked um, if the polling showed any differences in views on China in terms of ethnicity um, or um, socioeconomic class or geography. 
In other words, beyond just the Republican Democratic divide, um, that might tell us more about the longer term uh, uh, nature of the relationship. Did you have that level of granularity? We have only a thousand people in the sample, so it's difficult for us to get into geography in particular. Um, typically, people are interested in the farmers, for example, that you asked about, and we just can't slice these data that finely. Um, so we don't see large geographical differences that we can really um, speak to the Rust Belt or something of that sort. In terms of socioeconomic differences, very muted differences, if any, on this question, though we do see differences when it comes to whether or not the U.S. or China are, is seen as the preeminent economic power in the world. People who um, are less economically affluent in the United States are more likely to name China, whereas people who are more affluent in the U.S. are more likely to name the United States. Um, so we do see little bits when it comes to the balance of power and how people's economic, um, personal economic pocketbook issues relate to that. Um, in terms of racial differences in the United States, we do see small differences. Typically, African Americans in the U.S. tend to be slightly more positive towards China than do uh, white Americans, but they're not always very large or very consistent differences. And one of our incoming uh, master students uh, at Georgetown for the um, program I run in Asian Studies asked uh, whether the differences between millennials uh, or Gen, whatever we're on, Gen Z, is it? Uh, people in their 20s. I mean, in all foreign policy polling, people in their twenties are different. They're they're generally more comfortable with globalization, alliances, institutions. Um, but the question this person asked for you, Laura, is: Are are is this generation of young Americans going to be stamped by this? Uh, my answer would be no. Study at Georgetown, study at at Columbia and Sice, and 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 separate facts and fiction. But what do you think? Is this a generational stamp that we might see affect China policy for 20, 30, 40 years down the road? That's a great question. Um, we have never done, essentially in order to have enough people who have fallen to Gen Z, we need to do a teen poll. And at Pew, we've done a handful of these that are representative of the particular generation. We haven't done one that's touched on multilateralism. So I don't actually know in terms of attitudes towards China um, from our data, if Gen Z looks different than millennials. Um, we also have, um, kind of ambivalent evidence, it depends on the issue as to whether or not cohorts or age differences at a given section in time tend to be more determinative of people's attitudes. Um, this is one that we'd have to actually look back at retrospectively to be able to answer. So I'm not sure going forward how much it will matter. Um, but in terms of over time trends, regardless of the period in which we've surveyed from 2005 till the present, um, always we've seen older people more unfavorable towards China. So it's not necessarily a cohort as it advances, as much as older people at any point in time have tended to be more negative. And EJ, a couple questions, which I think should be directed to you. A journalist from Hong Kong asks us, you know, looking at Tom Cotton's tough legislation on China, Marco Rubio's and Nikki Haley's piece, he in the post, was it? Uh, uh, a former UN ambassador governor, Nikki Haley's piece, um, slamming China. Is this an indication that the 2024 race is already starting and it's going to be about China for Republicans uh, if, if, if uh, President, you know, post-Trump? Uh, is this a longer-term theme, you think? Um, I, as somebody who never expected President Trump to win in 2016, I've always told people that I resign my membership in the prognosticators union at about midnight on 2016 when he got that electoral college majority. We were right about the popular vote. So I think it is, if ever it were uh, difficult to predict what we're gonna look like in four years now, it's impossible. So I don't think those, uh, I don't think we can draw any conclusion about 2024 from that except that the people mentioned are all people who do want to run for the Republican nomination uh, for president. And clearly this is a position that is dominant in the Republican party for now. But again, I want to underscore that it is a broadly American position in American public opinion. I, you know, I, I think this dialogue has shown how big the gap is. Just to take two examples, the professor mentioned uh, Hong Kong, uh, obviously, many of us view this situation on the ground very differently. I would just point that there's polling among people in Hong Kong who are much more likely to blame the police than the demonstrators for that violence. And I think hearing that is disappointing uh, just as a, uh, you know, to make that reference because people in Hong Kong don't view it 
uh, that way. Similarly, a lot of us look at the Chinese propaganda that's out there kind of trying to suggest that the virus somehow originated with the Americans. Uh, and we say, why is the Chinese government in any way connected with that? So this gap uh, between us um, um, is pretty severe right now. And so those Republican politicians, as I say, I think are not just reflecting opinion in the Republican Party. They're reflecting a broader view, not necessarily on the specific um, issues. Um, you know, I still continue to believe that having students, uh, student exchanges in the long run is good for all of us. Uh, that's one area where um, I hope we can continue to have dialogue because in the long run, that's good for both. For, I think it's good for the United States. I think it's good for both sides. But in general, their views match, are not all that far from my views, and my political views are very different than theirs on most other questions. So I think it goes deeper than just Republican opinion right now. It is uh, striking when you talk to members of Congress um, and when you look at these opinion polls that Asia policy uh, and China policy are uh, the least partisan policy issues in many respects in the United States today. So this is uh, this is a this is not a problem to November, and all we got some very good questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. Um, almost nobody challenged um, the general pessimism about the about the trajectory in U.S.-China relations. Uh, public opinion in in the U.S. that we can measure a public opinion in China, which is harder to measure, but I think was accurately conveyed by Professor Jia. <clears throat> um, I. I um, I got a couple of questions we won't be able to get to, but I'll leave them with people to think about. A <clears throat> um, number of people asked um, whether a new Biden administration or even a second Trump administration uh, and uh, Xi Jinping um, will be able to pick up some of the pieces where we do have to cooperate. Um, people asked about North Korea policy. They asked about climate change. And they asked about um, uh, economic uh, 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 issues that are in our mutual interest. You know, 5G will be hard, but there are obviously other areas where we benefit. <laughs> um, and that's a hard question. Um, uh, my, um, uh, maybe I'll turn back quickly to the uh, panelists, let them each answer it. My uh, experience from five years in the White House, including a lot of summits, is that leadership and leaders matter. And if a President Biden or a reelected President Trump, and if Xi Jinping decide, um, there are things we have to cooperate on. Uh, they can do that. Uh, they can break through a lot of this. Um, agency leadership uh, uh, matters. Um, but uh, I think an incoming Biden administration is not going to suddenly say, okay, that was fun. Now let's be nice to China. Um, th these attitudes you're seeing are being baked in to policy debates. I've been on a lot of presidential campaigns. People are starting to formulate their assumptions and their policy ideas, and um, they're going to reflect the kind of discussions we've heard from Laura uh, and, from, and from EJ. And, um, and, and I would also just say that I think that um, Pew has done an enormous service with this poll, obviously for American journalists and scholars and the American public, but I would also argue for Chinese scholars. Um, in my scholarly work with Chinese counterparts, um, the emphasis is on declaratory policy, government documents, um, speeches, um, very, very precise, very um, rigorous, very rarely in Chinese scholarship do public opinion polls get broken apart and analyzed. And I would hope Chinese scholars and government officials would examine this Pew poll and others to try to look at some of these um, issues that will be with them as they deal with the United States for some time to come. Let me give you each um, a last minute or so for a wrap-up comment before we end. Um, and uh, we'll go in the order of play. So we'll start with you, Laura. Yeah, I will just say that one of the things we're interested to track going forward is also how um, public opinion in other countries registers um, this COVID-19 issue. We'll be polling going forward in 15 European countries, and we want to understand not only attitudes towards China, but also attitudes towards whether or not China and the United States are seen as responsible stakeholders globally and how they've dealt with the coronavirus outbreak, because both countries stand to either benefit or kind of be tarnished by their handling of this particular crisis. And we'll be very interested to see how public opinion tracks. Great, thanks, EJ. I hope maybe there will be two issues that could uh, 
uh, as John Kennedy said about the Cold War, push back the jungle of suspicion, a wonderful line from his inaugural address. Uh, we have to cooperate on the climate. Whatever our differences, neither country has an interest in destroying our planet. And so I hope this might provide some opening for a conversation between Americans and uh, Chinese uh, that uh, where we could both be constructive. Uh, eventually, after this period passes, global health issues, clearly pandemics, it is not in the interest of any country to have uh, a pandemic. And I hope that there might be cooperation on those areas. Uh, but I would go back to where we started. And I agree with you that this is a very challenging time because there are many of us who do not wish China ill, who respect the Chinese people enormously, who are deeply concerned about the direction of this regime and the movement away from some liberalization and the door seeming to shut on democratization. And I think the Chinese government really has to take into account that there are people here who would like good relations uh, with China, but will be continue to be very alarmed by some of these developments in China. Uh, and that on these fears, I think, and these worries, I think Americans across party lines are broadly united. Um, thank you, uh, Professor John. Okay, thank you. I think uh, the, uh, it's uh, important uh, for the two countries to be realistic. Uh, uh, of course, we want to uh, make progress. Uh, uh, we, we, we have our own de desired uh, uh, expectations, but we have to be realistic. Uh, uh, and 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 to be realist requires us to to evaluate our interests. Uh, you know where we have conflicts, where we have uh, you know shared uh, interests and stakes. I think we still have a lot of shared interests and stakes, and we should I try to identify them and try to work together on uh, on those uh, in issues uh, in in those areas. Uh, on this uh, pandemic, uh, I think we are working together to some extent. Uh, our scientists are working together, and also China is delivering uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, protective equipments to to the U.S. Uh, masks and that sort of thing. Uh, according to our uh, foreign policy spokesperson, uh, uh, you know, uh, probably every American has uh, seven masks uh, that from China. Uh, uh, of course, uh, some are donations. Some, uh, most of them, uh, you know, uh, are, are exports. Uh, but unlike some people's imaginations, uh, China has not uh, blocked uh, the, the this uh, shipment to the U.S. Uh, I think we believe that cooperate, we benefit, uh, and conflict, we suffer. Um. Thank you all very much. Uh, Laura Silver, congratulations on another um, insightful and important uh, pupil. Um, and EJ, congratulations on Code Red. Um, uh, everyone on the line should buy it soon. And thanks for your um, insights and for your, uh, and for your uh, being part of the Georgetown faculty. What a treat for our students. And John Jingle, thanks for joining us from Beijing where it's, it's late at night. Um, we, uh, we are going to do a third and fourth and fifth, I think, of this series. Uh, the next one will be led by my colleague, Professor Evan Medeiros, and we'll, we'll get dialogue among business leaders between the U.S. and China to, to, to probe that part of the relationship more. But for now, um, thank you all. This will be posted on the U.S.-China Dialogue website at Georgetown and Asian Studies. Um, and we appreciate everyone joining us, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, stay well. Thank you.